we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his companions, his household. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them, to bless us, and to grant us goodness. My brothers and sisters, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose them because they were the best of hearts after the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know that in the ranking, the status commences by that of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, and thereafter Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, and Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And thereafter, a lot of the other companions, some of them were told that you are from Jannah. Some of them were not given that good news in their lifetimes, but they were definitely chosen by Allah because when we hear the names of any one of them, we are supposed to say, Radiallahu anhu. May Allah be pleased with them. And may Allah be pleased with every one of us. This evening, I'd like to go through a very important aspect of the lives of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, all of them. And it is encapsulated in one hadith, although there are many other hadith that have spoken of this characteristic. They were the furthest away from haram. And they were the furthest away from anything they doubted. The minute they had a doubt, they considered it haram. The reason why they considered it haram, even if it was doubtful to them, is they did not want to risk their lives. They did not want to risk their link with Allah by involving in something that could be halal and could be haram. So they stayed away. Because if there is something that is debated that this is halal and this is haram, people are arguing a person who truly fears Allah, if he has the doubt in his heart, he will say, let me stay away. No one can tell me I'm wrong. The minute I fell into it, there is a chance. If I'm ready to take the chance, that chance is going to become bigger and bigger as the time passes until a day comes when I won't mind that this is haram. I'll say, no, it's okay. I'm sure someone somewhere says that it's fine. Now, when we hear of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, it's not very common that we are told about a Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu anhu. He was a great companion. One of the narrations that he is known for was the narration about halal and haram. His name was Nu'man, al Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu anhu. So he says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said clearly, Inna al halal bayyinun wa inna al haram bayyinun. وَبَيْنَهُمَا أُمُورٌ مُشْتَبِهَاتٌ أَوْ مُتَشَابِهَاتٌ He says, the Prophet ﷺ said, Halal is very clear and Haram is very clear. Those two categories are certain. Because in the eyes of Allah, something is either Halal or Haram. Allah knows it. In the eyes of Allah, there's no third category. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept the third category for you and I who may not have complete knowledge. For example, you see, and you know when we speak of halal or haram, there are many aspects, not only food, but the food might be halal, the money that you use to buy it might not be halal. So halal is food and drink as well as your income, as well as your relationships. You have a halal relationship, you have a haram relationship. For example, a person wants to marry someone and they find out that this person has been breastfed in the correct way by the same person that breastfed them. And some are arguing about it. Some are saying, no, it's not right. I don't think it's the case. And the others are saying, we are telling you it's the case. So the best thing to do in the eyes of Allah, Allah knows exactly what happened. But because our knowledge is limited, we might not know exactly what has happened. The best thing to do, stay away. Just say, look, I'll marry someone else. So even in your relationships, they can be halal and haram. And I've just given you one example. 
Now, when it comes to a relationship that is based on something evil, it is a haram relationship. For example, I develop a relationship with a man. In order to make him do something haram, that relationship is haram. We need to ask Allah's protection from this because shaitan is trapping us. Shaitan traps us by being so good to a person, knowing that this person is evil because we want something that person should do for us that is also evil. And this is why one of the signs of Qiyamah that the Prophet ﷺ told us and the Sahaba carried to us is a very interesting hadith. He says there will come a time when a person will be honored, not because he deserves honor, but because we fear his backlash. And yukram ar-rajulu makhafata sharri. Which means close to Qiyamah, people will respect someone, not because he deserves respect, because they are worried if I don't respect him, he can harm me, he can attack me, he can cause a problem for me. So that type of a relationship is also based on that which is wrong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. Now, halal and haram, very interestingly, when we hear the word, the first thing that comes to the mind is food. Food. Now, in the eyes of Allah, when it comes to food itself, Allah knows that this, is, this piece of meat is halal and this piece of meat is haram. Haram in two ways. One is, it could either be from an animal that cannot be halal, such as a pig, such as a dog, for example, or a monkey. Some people actually consume these animals. Or it can be from an animal that would otherwise be halal if it was slaughtered correctly, but it was not slaughtered correctly, so it renders it haram. We didn't cut it the proper way, but it's haram. So when you see a piece of meat, you either have knowledge that this is halal, so you consume it, or you don't have the knowledge. Subhanallah, what do you do when you don't have the knowledge? You either have the knowledge this is halal, so you consume it, or this is haram, so you stay away. But sometimes you might not know. This is where the Sahaba anhum's lives come in. Very interesting. What would they do? What did they do? They just stayed away. They said, I cannot risk. Why did they stay away? And this is where Nu'man ibn Bashir anhu's hadith comes in. Why did they stay away? I mean, it's important today. Let's be honest. A lot of us are looking for two things. We're looking for something cheap and something tasty. Let's be honest. If it's tasty or cheap, we are ready to con we are ready to risk anything and everything. May Allah forgive us. Sometimes we've gone to the degree that we're ready to do a haram deal in business just because we think that you know what? It's okay now. Allah is forgiving and this is a big deal. Let's just go for it, take it, consume it. The, whether it is interest, whether it is something else. Now, why did the Sahaba of Allah stay away? Listen to the reason. It is so powerful that if we were to think about it, we would never want to touch that which is doubtful again, whether it is a relationship, whether it is consumption of the food, or whether it is the income. May Allah protect us all. We are indeed living in trying times because the commercialization of everything has made it attractive. And sometimes innocent people, unsuspecting people, ignorant people, sometimes for whatever reason, they happen to falter. And sometimes we become evil and we don't even know that we have become evil. So this hadith says, Bainahuma umur. Between the halal and the haram, there are certain things that are not so clear. It's a gray area. For who? Not for Allah. Allah knows that it's not gray. For Allah, this is either halal or haram. His knowledge is superior. It is supreme. But for everyone else. And those people are of categories. That's why Allah says, لا يعلموهن كثير من الناس. Many people might not know what's the ruling on this. So if it is to do with halal and haram and you don't know specifically, you should stay away. Because the hadith continues to say, فَمَنِ اتَّقَ الشُّبُهَاتِ فَقَدِ اسْتَبْرَأَ لِدِينِهِ وَعِرْضِهِ the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever stayed away from that which was doubtful, they have protected themselves without a doubt. No one can tell them that what you did was wrong. And, and they have protected their honor, their dignity, their iman, their heart, and everything that follows. Protected it. 
Whoever was prepared to go into that which was doubtful is prepared to go straight into haram. Because they know that there is a possibility, if I'm ready to do it, knowing that there's a chance that this could be pork, what would happen? It means I'm ready to compromise my relation. I'm just taking a risk. It's a chance. And you know that we're not allowed to take such chances as Muslimin. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, whoever stays away has protected himself, his deen and his honor. And whoever has fallen, has fallen into haram. One might say, how did he fall into haram? Simple, I explained it. He was ready to risk it. So the fact that you're ready to risk it, tomorrow you will risk the real haram. And you will say, nah, it's okay. Shaitan comes to you bit by bit and makes you reduce the value of haram in your eyes so that you start justifying something which is totally, absolutely, clearly haram at a point because you used to justify that which was doubtful. It's a matter of time. It's a sign of the hour. So now, the Prophet ﷺ gives a beautiful example of a shepherd. Similar to a shepherd who has a flock of sheep that needs to graze on his land, but he takes that flock right to the border with his neighbor, a border that is not demarcated. Subhanallah. If you were an honest man, you would say, I'm not taking near the border because I don't want this sheep to feed on that which is haram. This is so powerful that when the sheep has consumed something that is haram, not only is the sin upon the person who is the shepherd, but in fact it has an impact on that meat as well. Subhanallah, you and I might consume it. This is why the meat is supposed to be known as two things, halal and tayyib. Tayyib means pure. Sometimes something is halal, but it's not pure. Why? Because before it was slaughtered, it was treated so badly that it was unacceptable for a human being to treat a chicken like that, to treat a cow like that, to treat a sheep like that. They treated it so inhumanely and you want to consume it. They could have slaughtered it with the name of Allah 100 times. But what they did before that was also to be considered. What did they feed it? How did they keep it? It's supposed to be something halal. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum had rules and regulations laid down by Muhammad sallallahu They were worried, does this animal see the other animal? Will it even seeing the animal was a problem? Subhanallah, what do we do? May Allah forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. This is one aspect. It's only about the meat because of this example that we're giving. But it's very interesting to see how deep Islam goes. So we say this is halal, but is it tayyib? Is it pure? If it is not, it might be okay, okay to consume it, but it's not the best of meats. It will have some form of a negative impact on you if you knew it and you still continued. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. This is why all those who slaughter, all those who, uh, who are involved in this entire industry, we need to make sure that the, the, the standard is extremely high by the, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah help us to be kind to the animals. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to be kind to the animals even upon the slaughter. It's a hadith that says Allah has written goodness upon everything. So when you are sacrificing for the sake of Allah, make sure that you do it with kindness and goodness. Then the hadith says, this shepherd who was ready to actually graze the sheep right on the border, knowing that I don't know this is demarcated. Had he feared Allah, he would have stayed in the center, right in the middle where no one can argue whose land it is and whose uh, grass the sheep is grazing from. Subhanallah. Then the hadith says, Allah, this is a hadith speaking of halal and haram. But Allah says, Behold, every king has limits. And Allah's limits are, that, are those things that he has made haram. Don't cross them. Now, what's the connection? Let me tell you, when you are not bothered about halal and haram, you won't be bothered about whether what you are doing is within the limit of Allah or not? Because the energy that you derived was from what? From a haram source. Do you really think that the haram source is going to give you energy that is going to empower you to do that which pleases Allah or displeases Allah? 
That's why the Sahaba radiallahu anhum was so concerned that if they were to put one morsel known as a luqma of food that was haram in their mouths, they would be worried as to what impact it's going to have on your thinking, your seeing, your energy, everything else, your relationships, your whatever else. Here Allah is talking in the same narration through the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu telling us that you've got to be so careful about halal and haram and you have to stay away from that which is doubtful because if you don't, then you are going to go beyond the limits of Allah in everything else. And every king has limits. And Allah has set limits. What are they? Maharimuhu. That means that which Allah has made haram. It's a limit. Who would dare do that which Allah has made haram without batting an eyelid? Those who are consuming haram. Whether it is interest, whether it is haram meat, whether it is that which was stolen and pinched through deception, whatever other way. But Allah says it's going to have an impact on you. You are going to cross the limits. And remember the limits of Allah is that which is haram. There comes a time Allah gives you a chance. He gives you a further chance. He has a rope tied tightly on our necks. He gives us a moment. He releases the rope. He releases the rope until a time comes when he knows it's getting too much. He pulls that entire rope and suddenly everything is gone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not do that to us. May Allah protect us. So my brothers and sisters, let's end this hadith. Because like I said, the most powerful part is right at the end. The hadith says, Allah, behold, we want to tell you something else. Inna fil jasadi la mudgha. Indeed, in the body, there is an organ. You know the term mudgha, what it means? It is actually a piece of flesh. A piece of flesh that has a shape. It's known as mudgha, as though it was chewed. Chewed piece of flesh. So the hadith says, behold, in the body there is a piece of flesh. This is speaking about halal and haram, same hadith, a sentence or two down. Allah is telling us through the lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, hey, there is definitely an organ in the body. إِذَا صَلَحَتْ صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ If it is pure, clean, good, then the whole body is pure, clean, good. If you were concerned about halal, your thinking is going to be halal, your eyes are going to be halal, your speech is going to be beautiful, you will want to do the dhikr of Allah, you won't be lazy for salah, you won't be lazy for ibadah, you are going to go in the right direction, you are going to have uh, closeness to Allah, you will be pure, you will be good, you will have good thoughts of people, you will want to help people, you will want to do so much of goodness. Why? Because what you are consuming is halal and it is pure. If that organ is pure, clean, the whole body is pure, clean. Everything to do with the body, pure and clean. But if that organ is corrupt because of haram consumption, because of not even worried, being worried about going into that which is totally doubtful, what will happen? That organ becomes corrupted. And as a result, the whole body is corrupt. Your thinking is bad. You can't think straight. No matter how much someone explains to you one plus one is two, you say, no, it's five. It's five. And you are wondering, this might be a simple example, but in a spiritual aspect, it's correct. Someone will tell you, brother, what are you doing? You say, well, what's wrong? You cannot see what's wrong. You can't. Why? Because you are blind. Blind because of what? Your consumption is haram. Watch your food. Watch your earning. Watch what you are eating. Be careful. Rather eat the vegetables that you grow in your own yard. Subhanallah, than to go into something haram. So we should not become food lovers for the sake of loving the food, but rather we should become halal lovers for the sake of loving Allah. That's what it should be. Whenever I see a sign saying food lovers, I say, I say to myself, those who want to consume haram, they can use this statement here to bypass Allah. I love food. It tastes nice and it's cheap. Two things. I told you people love taste and they love price. This is cheap. Subhanallah. May Allah forgive us. I remember a few weeks ago, someone actually told me, you know, these elephants, they are, they are selling meat now. It's nice, it's white, it's soft, it tastes like cotton wool. Is it halal? I said, stop, brother. You already tasted it. What do you want me to ask to, to say? You already tasted it. What do you want me to say? You already told me it tastes like cotton wool. Now you are telling me, is it halal? Which means you are coming to rubber stamp what you already were doing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. This is one example that comes to my mind. But my brothers and sisters, look at what Allah is telling us. 
Be careful because it will impact your whole body. Then Allah says, and when I say through the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I mean it's the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but it's definitely from Allah ultimately. So, so we are told, Allah wa al qalbu. Behold, that organ is the heart. The heart. Now you know the heart. What happens with the heart? You are known by the heart. All your illnesses and sicknesses are known through the heart. Anyone who gets physical disease, they have a blood test, it's told. Where does the blood pump from? The heart, subhanallah. Physical sickness through the heart and through the blood, you are told. This is a problem. Another thing, spiritual ailment, the heart becomes dead. No dhikr of Allah. No Quran. When the Quran is brought forth, you feel lazy, very lazy. Time of salah, there is no scope. May Allah protect us. May Allah protect us. It's a fact. The Sahaba radiallahu anhu, they were worried if they felt for a moment that there was something trying to hold them back from salah, they would defy it and still read their salah because they knew the only way to tackle shaitan is to fight him, defy him. When you really don't want to get up, that is the moment you get up. Shaitan lost the battle, he's gone. Subhanallah. When you really feel that you don't want to read Astaghfirullah, Quran, that's the moment you pick it up and you read even if it's for five minutes. What did you do? You prove not to someone else. Today, we want to prove a point to every Tom, Dick and Harry. No, we are proving to Shaitan that you know what? You are mardood, mal'oon, you are cursed and I'm not going to follow you. I'm going to do what is right. This is the beauty. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us protection. Look at the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Their thinking was absolutely immaculate. They could understand immediately, this is right, this is wrong. Why? The income was halal. The consumption was halal. The minute someone's income is haram, they won't understand right from wrong. They won't see good from evil. They won't understand who is actually calling them towards goodness and who is calling them towards destruction. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu in tattakullaha yaj'al lakum furqana wa yukaffir ankum sayyatikum wa yaghfir lakum wallahu dhul fadli al-azim O you who believe if you are going to have taqwa and piety and consciousness of Allah, He will give you the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. He's going to give you that strength to know what is good and what is bad. Subhanallah, yaj'al lakum furqanan and He will forgive your sins thereafter. Whatever you did in the past, it's the past. Let's start afresh. Let's start a new leaf and we will earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Allah says Allah's virtue is great. Allah will give you you don't need to go to haram to earn. Your morsel, your sustenance is written. When you chose the haram way, it still came to you. When you chose the halal way, it still came to you. The difference is you messed your heart in the process or you protected it. And you link with Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us more conscious. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to understand what is right from wrong. May, we, may Allah forgive us for what has passed. For indeed, we may have made mistakes. May this serve as an encouragement so that on the day of Qiyamah, we are resurrected with the same Sahaba radiallahu anhum who narrated not only this hadith, but who showed us 